Good morning, sunshines, and welcome to another episode of Game of Thrones Review by me. This is going to be Season 7, Episode 6. There will be spoilers, so if you haven't seen the episode or you don't know what happens or you don't want to be spoiled, exit out of the video right now. <laughs> Go watch it and then come back. You're welcome. So episode six of this season is our second to last episode of the season, which typically is like a dreaded episode for Game of Thrones. We definitely got that big battle scene and we got kind of a dramatic death, I guess, though not the one that I was necessarily expecting. I'm gonna go ahead and just break down the video bit by bit. We'll just see what happened and what I think about it. We don't have Ashley here this week. She's in Chicago, I believe. So it's just me. We're just gonna get started. First, we'll go over what happened south of the wall. We have Arya and Sansa in Winterfell. The first scene we meet with them, Arya tells a nice story about when she was a kid and she's shooting arrows that she wasn't supposed to be shooting or some shit. After this, she berates Sansa for Sansa's betrayal and that letter that she wrote to Joffrey. To me, it seems a little dramatic. I feel like obviously Sansa was a scared little girl at the time, didn't know what the hell was going on, wasn't aware that her father was going to die subsequently. I just think this was just dramatic of Arya to do. But maybe she's just restless and she's cooped up in Winterfell and she's used to running around being an assassin so she's bored, so she's just picking fights. I don't know where this is coming from. I'm trying to see like from a character arc development standpoint why Arya would act like this. Because yeah, they squabbled when they were kids, but everyone squabbles when they're kids. I fought with my sisters and my brothers so much when I was a kid. Obviously now I don't because I've developed and I know that I love them at the end of the day and their family. Arya does not seem, she doesn't seem to have evolved to accept Sansa as she is at this point. Next scene we get with them, Sansa's confessing to Littlefinger of how Arya got the letter. This is my first hint as to how possibly, I don't even know, if Sansa and Arya could be in on it together to go against Littlefinger, that would be cool because Sansa confesses to Littlefinger, who's the least trustworthy person that I could think of to confess a insecurity with. <laughs> the last person I would go to is Littlefinger. She should have gone to Brienne or anyone or one of the, I don't know, northern people that she associates with and gets along with, not Littlefinger, that just seems strange to me. Thanks, Max, for your cameo. So I thought that was weird, and then, so she tells him that Arya found the letter, and Littlefinger obviously is the one that planted the letter for Arya to find. So I'm wondering, either they are perfectly playing into Littlefinger's trap, or they've caught on and maybe said something behind the scenes. I don't, that's the only hope that I get out of this because then Littlefinger literally tells her, oh, Brienne would stop anything. If any conflict happened, Brienne would be there to help. I'm like, okay, I guess. And then the next scene we get is Sansa or the North getting a letter from Cersei to come down to King's Landing for some reason. So she decides she's not leaving no matter what because John's already left, someone's gotta stay there. And so she decides to send Brienne. Now in my opinion, if, if they're not working against Littlefinger, then I think she should have sent Arya because it would have been a Stark girl. Arya could have gone to kill Cersei, which she wants to do anyway. If Arya's acting like this, then maybe she is just restless and she needs to get out and she needs to go be doing something. And I feel that that would have been a wiser decision to make than sending Brienne, your best fighter, the one that protects you, the one that's sworn to protect both of you, the one that Littlefinger just advised to use. So it just directly conflicts with that scene, so I'm curious as to why or what the reasoning was behind that. So Sansa gets defensive with Brienne because Brienne's like, no, I want to stay, can you send someone else? Or she says, at least let me leave Podrick or something. And then Sansa says, the road's long, you need to go now, go. And then the last scene we get with them is obviously when Sansa breaks into Arya's room, which it's like poking a sleeping bear with a stick. You're just like poking it. Why, when she's already not getting along with Arya, is she gonna go snoop in Arya's room? For what purpose? What's she trying to find here? I guess she's trying to find the note. Is she trying to steal the note back or something? I don't know. So she sneaks into Arya's room, finds these face, the faces in Arya's bag, which I think is so creepy because that's not how I really imagined them to be. <laughs> I just thought it was kind of like a magic thing that you did and you became that person. It wasn't like a physical skin that you put on, but that's gross, cool, whatever. So she finds faces, Arya comes in, Arya's being really creepy, super, and then ends up giving Sansa the knife at the end after completely scaring the shit out of her. I think that's interesting that Littlefinger gave Bran the knife and then Bran gave Arya the knife and then Arya has now given it to Sansa. And I'm not sure why or what the significance of that is, but I'm very curious to see and I'm sure we'll figure out the next episode. Cause that seemed like a huge thing to do without explaining why or how or I just, I didn't understand it. So that's the Arya and Sansa thing that we have. I personally hope, hope that they're not being tricked by Littlefinger and that they're actually plotting something against him. But at the same time, that doesn't explain their arguments when he's not even around, unless they're assuming he's listening in. So we'll see where that goes. So after we have Tyrion and Daenerys, they're talking in the little council room at Dragonstone. Daenerys is like, 
I'm just glad you're not a hero, Tyrion. You wouldn't just go running off like all my ex-boyfriends and, and that John guy. All my ex-boyfriends and, and John. And it's just funny that she groups them all in that same uh, sentence as John. They kind of reiterate that John and Daenerys have a thing for each other. The show is obviously pushing us towards that. And then Tyrion and her get in kind of an argument over who is going to take over the throne if something happens to her, which I think is a good hint at a child. She says she can't have a child that she's barren after the dragons. So I don't know if it's just saying that because she's going to overcome it, maybe have one anyway, or if it's saying she's not going to have a kid. Because later, or earlier actually, we get a hint from Jorah, but I'll go into that in a minute. They're arguing over that, and it is interesting, like who would take over the throne if Daenerys did come to be the queen and she can't have kids then who would take it over after her so i thought that was actually a good question on Tyrion's part and i can also see why she would be offended because she's like i'm not gonna die i'm in this to win this you know what i mean so we'll see where that happens or where that goes maybe she's gonna have a baby now we can get into the juice of the episode we have the fellowship of the ring as they look like to me as they're going north of the wall all together and this little group of misfits first scene opens up they're having some banter and everything which i love you gotta love a good nice banter between the characters that you just want to see interact like Tormund talking about Brienne and everything that's so cute you just want them to get together but you know everyone can't get together it can't be a perfect happy ending but we'll just hope for it. John tries to give Jorah a long claw which was given to him by Commander Mormont Jorah's dad. John <laughs> ever the honest loyal such a great person that he is this is rightfully yours Jorah and then Jorah says no keep it that's good John gets to keep long claw because that is a Valyrian steel sword which is obviously effective against white walkers. Jorah says oh you'll pass it down to your children which is the first hint that we get in episode of the child again because they bring it up like three or four times i swear so jorah says no you give it to your children you can pass it down so i'm like who's john gonna have kids with the crew is going on and then they get attacked by a polar bear an undead polar bear a white which i thought was interesting because in the book it says the white walkers will ride undead polar bears dire wolves mammoths or horses they'll ride these things just undead all the time i think so it is known that they can make other things besides humans into whites or the undead, which could be foreshadowing for the dragon later, but I don't think it is. And I'll tell you why later in a minute. They get attacked by this polar bear. Polar bear just destroys them or destroys Thoros, who is the fire priest that Beric has brought with them with the Brotherhood. I think it's a bummer that they, I guess they had to kill someone and that was someone that's easy to kill, I don't know, but they kill off Thoros, or he gets wounded mortally. I think he dies a little later. Because the hound is looking at him, the hound's scared of fire, so he's like, oh no, I can't. And then I feel that it just shows the bear mauling him for so long that I'm so annoyed. And I'm like, where is John? Where is everyone else? What are the other 10 people doing in the group, you know? Because not everyone's died yet. They have those little extra wildling people that they just kill off. But I was just annoyed that Thoros was being attacked for so long and no one else was helping besides the hound just sitting there staring at it like, I'm so afraid. I was so mad during that scene and I feel like it happens later too, but I digress. The crew continues on. In a bit, they they get to a batch of whites led by a white walker who are not with the group or with the army. They're just scouting or something. I don't know what they're doing. And the white walker comes across their little campfire thing and I don't know, notices that there are definitely humans around, looks up and then they jump attack them, which I think is just silly that you can jump attack a white walker because I feel like their senses are better just from how they've attacked people in the past and like the forest and stuff, but I don't know. John ends up killing the white walker and as the white walker dies, his 11 of the whites just disintegrate because I guess they were reanimated by him. So if you kill the white walker that reanimated the specific whites, then those whites will then die, which I think could have been brought up earlier. And I think it's kind of strange that they just brought that up now. So I don't know if that's something they've just made up or if that's in fact how it is. I think it makes sense at the end of the day, but one white survives this because I guess he was created by a different white walker. They wrap that guy up and he puts up not much of a fight. And compared to the other whites that they've been in contact with, for example, the one that was at the wall, the first one that John came in contact with, that white seemed to put up more of a fight where you couldn't just tie the guy up and put a bag over his head and it would have been fine. I still feel like this plan is a little unrealistic, but they pulled it off, they did it, props to them. So they've got the white, and then the white makes a lot of noise and they get attacked by the rest of the army. They somehow still get the white with them to run out to this rock in the middle of this ice lake as the army descends upon them, but not before they send off 
Gendry, which comes to my only real complaint about the episode, I guess, is that they send Gendry back to Eastwatch, which has got to be miles and miles away. They've been traveling for a while, you would think. And he's the worst one in the snow. At the beginning, he said he's never seen snow before. So why you would send Gendry to go tracking miles across the snow, it just doesn't make sense to me. I, I think that's the last person I would send because he's definitely more of a fighter than he is of a snowstorm runner, marathon runner. <laughs> it just, I don't know, that didn't make total sense to me, but fair enough. So they send Gendry off and then Gendry gets to the wall and then says, we have to send a raven. And John is the one who tells him to send a raven to Daenerys. So at the end of the day, this is all his fault. Just saying. <laughs> Somehow this raven gets to Daenerys in a very short span of time, which I just think isn't realistic because consistently throughout the seasons, foot travel and ravens and things like that take time. I feel that this isn't consistent with that, but at the same time, I'm willing to like let it go because whatever, it's like it's a small thing to overlook, whatever. Daenerys gets this warp speed traveling raven, decides she's gonna run off and save, save John and the crew. Tyrion advises against it. He's like, if you're gone, we have nothing. And he's already like, I just talked to you about having a successor. Now you're gonna go sacrifice yourself. Like, what do I do? She says, last time you told me you'd do me nothing, you were wrong. So I'm not doing that again. And she leaves anyway, like a badass motherfucker. Daenerys goes. Meanwhile, they're all on the rock. The hound chunks a rock. And stupidly, all the whites are like, oh, this means that we can go on the ice now. And they wander out there. It just seems silly. Some of it just seems kind of like, like too much silliness almost, where I'm like, is this Twilight or is this, you know, Game of Thrones? Nonetheless, it's an enjoyable episode. Like, I enjoy the episode, whatever. The whites all start attacking. The crew is overwhelmed. And then Daenerys and Drogon swoop in just in time. Also, side note, why did Daenerys take all three of her dragons? When she fought Jaime and them on the battle, or on that field, she only brought Drogon. And so I don't really understand why she brought all three, because she doesn't, from my understanding, usually she only takes Drogon. You know what I mean? She doesn't take all three. I don't know. I feel like she could have just taken Drogon because she's just going out there to save them. However, she takes all three. She swoops in. They're you know, setting everything ablaze and then sit down and then everyone else gets to get on top of Drogon, which I thought was interesting because I didn't know that anyone could ride the dragon if Daenerys was on it because I feel like she probably could have used that in other situations, but that's fine. <laughs> they all get onto the dragon, including the dead white. Oh, as they're getting on, of course, the most epic thing of this fucking episode, Syrian, her other dragon named after her brother, gets taken out by the Night King, who conveniently overlooks Drogon and Daenerys and the crew who are sitting. Literally, the way they shoot it, you can see that Drogon is closer and more convenient to hit, and he overlooks them, and he's like, nah, I'm gonna get that one. Challenge accepted. <laughs> he's showing off or something. I don't understand why he would do that. Though I have small theory as to why, but we'll get to that in a second. So he chunks it, hits Viserion, Viserion falls, bleeding like crazy down. Because when Drogon got hit with the scorpion, he didn't bleed at all. So I guess because maybe the, the ice thing like shatters after it hits him or something. I don't know if dragons are super sensitive to ice things. Though you would think they wouldn't be because fire melts ice. I don't know. So dragon goes down, falls into the ice lake. Very depressing. John is being, sees that, he's sad, he's overtaken with emotion, whatever, he's like slamming these whites down and then as the white walker or the night king goes to pick up another one to hit the second dragon he's like just go just go and then he's telling them to go and Daenerys is like no nah, I'm not gonna go but then she sees him fall into the ice like and she's like okay we're fucked she goes they get away the night king throws another spear and misses her and the crew which is lucky. John falls into the water and the army kind of disperses after that. Now, what I think is interesting here is that if you look, when it goes back to John, it's 56 minutes into the episode if you want to find it. But Longclaw, his sword is sitting by the hole in the lake and the whole thing is white, the whole sword and the wolf's head thing is white. And then as he pops out of the water to grab Longclaw, the eyes of it open. It's kind of creepy and weird, and I don't know the purpose of that, but I thought that was so cool. And when I went back and looked at it, I had to watch it like four times. I was like, the eyes literally, and you can kind of see them, they like open. It's kind of creepy, but very cool. So I'm not sure what the significance of that is, but we'll see, I'm sure, or I'm sure someone or something will explain that. So John pops out, and then the Night Kings and the army's still there. He's like, ah, shit. <laughs> they turn around and just see him. And I personally think when he's limping like that, he looks like a, a white. They're obviously going to attack him, and he's like, gosh, now I have to die again. And he's got his sword out, ready to fight. And then Benjen swoops in and saves the day. And I'm bummed that John and Benjen didn't get like a proper reunion because the reason John joined the Night Watch was 
because of Benjen, because they got along really well. He felt like ambassador, didn't feel like he belonged in Winterfell, so he went to join the Night's Watch, like his Uncle Benjen, who he looked up to. So I'm bummed that they didn't get, like, a proper reunion. And I'm bummed that Benjen wasn't just like, we can both go on the horse at the same time. I guess not. So Benjen gives him his horse and sacrifices himself. So I guess they could finally get rid of that character, because people kept asking about him. John runs off on that horse and goes back to the wall, to East Watch. Next scene we get, we have Daenerys, who is looking out at the horizon, at the wall, into the distance, as Drogon's like screaming from sadness or whatever from his brother dying. <laughs> In my head, my immediate like instinct reaction, oh, she's so sad that her dragon died. She's just mourning it right now. And then I realized this bitch is just looking for John. Are you that hung up on this guy already? I was kind of annoyed about it, honestly. The passion that she had for her dragons and the, how much she loves her dragons and how those are her children. And that is the only thing that means anything to her at the end of the day, besides getting the fucking throne. And the fact that she was just looking for John. I'm like, why are you sobbing hysterically? You should be crying. You should be so distraught. I would say she's just learned to control her emotions. I'm just annoyed that she was pining over John at the moment. I don't know. I guess it's cool. Like, I'm, I'm happy with the love story. I'm fine with it. Even though it's slightly incestual. Every time people say something about them being incestual, I'm like, do you realize that in the books, George Martin wrote where Cal Drogo got with Daenerys when she was 13? She's a little kid. And that rape scene and everything happens, that's pedophilia. There are way worse things that go down in this book. I don't know why you're crying over a little bit of incest. Especially because at least there's one thing between it and it's not like twins because that was really gross to me. But aunt and cousin, I feel like in these books, you're like, okay, whatever, that's fine. I can accept that over pedophilia and twins, in my opinion, but obviously not in normal life. I would not say that would be normal, <laughs> but the Targaryens are known for being incestual because they want to keep their bloodline pure. Anyway, the lone writer comes out, Daenerys sees that it's John. John's back, John's alive, cool. John's sitting there all shirtless and hot looking and you can see all the scars and everything. So I thought it was interesting that Daenerys could actually see that he did in fact take a knife to his heart for his people. So she knows that he's this genuine guy, etc. And then she sits down, they talk for a second and she says she's glad that she went up there. He said, I wish you, we never went. And I'm personally not glad she went up there and I don't think she should have been glad. I think she should have been extremely pissed about her dragons, but that's fine. He calls her Danny, which made me want to gag because I feel like that's what everyone who can't spell Daenerys just calls her. Then he's, he bends the knee. Cool. That's what happens at the end of the episode. So they're obviously feeling each other. He bends the knee. So I feel like all the Northern Lords who already want to overthrow him at this point because they're so wishy-washy are not going to be happy about that. We'll see if that plays out at all. But I feel like once she lands there with a couple dragons, they're gonna be like, cool, it's fine, totally fine. <laughs> then we have the last scene of the episode. We have the whites. I think it's funny because when John pulls himself out of the water, they're all still kind of there moping around, whatever. So I feel like after that battle happened, or the White Walkers were like, okay, we're gonna get these chains. Cause you can see there's like some structure over there that they get the chains from. And the last scene, they're using the chains to pull this dragon out. How they got the chains around the dragon, I'm not really sure because I don't think they can swim, but I don't know, if it was a shallow lake, I suppose they could just kind of wrap it around its horns or something. I don't know. So they pull the dragon out. Now this is significant because if you remember when the Night King is standing on that one beach or whatever, and John and all of them are on the boat, he raises his hands and all the dead people open their eyes and they're all whites and they all come and they freak John out. John's like, oh my gosh, the army of dead. The Night King did not touch them for that. So I think that he grabbed the chains, pulled the dragon out, and then went up and touched Viserion. And then Viserion's eyes turned blue. I think that that would, was making Viserion a white walker or white flyer rather than a white because he physically touched him. And that's what he does with Craster's sons. He touches them on the forehead and that turns them. And then I saw this theory that I thought was very interesting on gray area. If you wanna check out her, I'll probably link the video below if I remember. She said that it's a good possibility that only dragon's blood can turn into a white walker. And that's why the white walkers aren't just turning everyone into white walkers. They're, they can only turn Targaryen blood basically or dragons into white walkers because the bears and everything they ride are obviously undead. They're whites, which is different than a white walker. When he touches the dragon, the dragon turns into a white walker. I think that that means that the dragon has control over its own body. It's not just an undead minion, in my opinion. I think that's what that means. And she also said dragon blood, and that's why maybe Craster is part Targaryen or something. That's why he only takes his sons to be white walkers. And that's why he's not turning just every dead person that he comes in contact with into a white walker which I think is a good theory. And also why maybe he didn't hit Drogon at the beginning and instead went for Viserion because he wanted his dragon and he didn't want to kill Daenerys because Daenerys is Targaryen and could therefore 
be turned into a White Walker Queen, maybe. And I also think, oh, that possibly, I think that the, okay, the Night King is a green seer like Bran, which is why he can communicate with Bran when Bran is in his visions or like in the Ravens or anything and made eye contact with him, he could communicate. And he also, when Bran was in that one vision, just walking through the dead bodies, the Night King seemed to be able to see him. Just like the three-eyed Raven could see, could talk to Bran while he was in visions and everything too. So I think that the Night King is also a green seer and that maybe he knew that he could get an ice dragon. And so that was like his plan all along was to kind of Lord and Eris there. Although how he would know that they were gonna come, I don't know. But I kind of thought that it was kind of trap-like of him to not just kill them right away and kind of leave them on that rock without everyone attacking him and just be like, wait, I'm waiting for these dragons. <laughs> I know they're gonna show up. I synced it, I synced it. I don't know, but that's a cool theory and I think that would be interesting. And I think it's cool that I'm pretty sure that the Syrian is a white walker or white flyer and not a white. Those are two different things. <laughs> so that's my theory. Let me know what you think down below. I thought this episode was super interesting. I'm excited to see the last episode and how they wrap everything up. I thought the trailer was very like, ooh, what's gonna happen? It looked like they were putting on this scene to show the whites to Cersei, but then it also looked like they had all their armies together. So I don't know if the armies are marching north to get the army of the dead or if they're marching to attack Cersei, but we'll see on the last episode next week. And then we have to wait a year, guys, a year. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. And I would love to hear some more theories down below. I've only watched a couple from this episode, so I would love to hear more. So let me know what your thoughts are. I will see you on our last Game of Thrones season seven, episode seven review next week. And I'll probably see you in a vlog tomorrow because in case you didn't know, my, I got a face laser treatment done. My face has been peeling for a week and I also broke my toe, which I'd show you, but it's gross. And so I haven't been doing much the last week, but that's why and I'm going to get back on the upload game now. And you'll see a vlog tomorrow. And that's all I have to say for you. I'm gonna shut up now. I'm just really excited to talk about Game of Thrones because I'm lame. But see you next week. Bye.